right. Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Brown from Epic Games. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to have been in this industry for about 20 years now. But I actually got into doing this. Uh, I came into the industry with a background in biology and behavioral science. And I wanted to share a little bit of that with you today to show how you can use that in level design. Uh, because I want to talk about choice theory. And when someone sits down to play a video game, they are very much at our mercy. They are constrained by our rules. They're locked into the path of the world that we build. And they're limited by the controls that we set up for them. But we never want them to actually feel that way. If we're doing our jobs well, then the player will always feel like they're the one who's actually in control. We want to give them the illusion of choice so that they can continue to have a great time. And by understanding how people actually make choices, we have a much better chance of maintaining that illusion. Now, how we choose is, of course, this huge topic, and there's no way I can cover it all in 30 minutes. So I wanted to kind of give you three introductory concepts, uh, the paradox, availability, and sunk costs. And I'm going to talk about each one individually, just kind of in a general context, before moving on to showing you how you can use them in terms of level design. So starting with the paradox, this is Temple Grandin. She is a behavioral scientist who developed this special chute for funneling herds of cattle into the slaughterhouse. And as the cows move into the chute, they are understandably uncooperative and scared. And then the chute gets narrow and turns and gets narrow and turns and narrow and turns. And it keeps doing that until the cows have no choices left. The only thing that they can do is funnel forward calmly in a single file line. And Dr. Grandin was able to develop this by studying her own mind because she suffers from autism, a disease which makes it very easy for her to become overwhelmed by even the most simplest of everyday choices. Through her research, she was able to show that we could actually be happier with less choice in our lives. And that concept has become known as the paradox of choice. We know that choice is essential to player autonomy, but new research is showing that that's only true up to a certain point. Beyond that threshold, the vast number of choices that we're faced with can actually be overwhelming. Your brain starts to panic, and you feel like things are spinning out of control. And this is why it's so important that we maintain that illusion of choice. Too much actual choice, and we can actually break our player's flow state, which makes the game, in their eyes, less fun or interesting. And I found it curious, Wired Magazine did a review of Fallout 4. Call out to Joel, he's going to be a lot in this talk today. Uh, and they said, and I quote, Release from your pod the swirl of emotions and questions threaten to overwhelm right when you need to remain focused. You have no idea where to begin, and it's a stark introduction to just how vast and open this world is. But despite the near futility of your situation, the seamless introduction of mechanics and systems has you feeling prepared to face whatever you might discover. In this case, Bethesda is purposefully using the paradox of choice to evoke an overwhelming emotional state in the player, and it works because it's all an illusion. The elements of the game unfold logically. New environments, new controls are seamlessly introduced, and the actual game elements themselves never break that player's flow state. And this shows you that once you know about things like the paradox, you can actually use them as a tool to your advantage. Next concept is something that's called the availability heuristic which basically means that the more familiar something is to you, the more you are likely to believe it or to like it. And this is, as much, this is due as much to our biology as it is psychology. If you think of your brain as this crazy, complicated web of billions of neurons, and if you want to get a thought from one end of that web to the other, those neurons will actually start to form little shortcuts, little hops, little skips that 
form to help us make decisions quickly. Something that happens to you more often creates more of these shortcuts and therefore becomes more and more available to your memory, hence the name. This means that as a designer, you are much more likely to implement a design that meshes with your own personal experiences. Instead of one that's better or more meaningful for your players, even when you are purposely trying not to do that. How many shooters have you played where you end up in an air conditioning duct? How many RPGs have you played where you end up exploring the sewers beneath the city? These aren't great original experiences, and we all know that, yet we keep building them. After a lifetime of playing them over and over, they are familiar to us. So our brains shortcut to referencing them as fun experiences because familiarity breeds liking. Um, the effects of the availability heuristic can be incredibly subtle. You probably don't even realize that they're affecting you like they do every day. Uh, at one point, we wanted to update our classic Unreal Tournament logo. It was a little bit too old school. We wanted to give it a more modern, fresh design. We found a couple that we liked, and then we realized that the new logos had been designed by someone who had been playing a heck of a lot of Quake. <clears throat> now, the availability heuristic doesn't just affect you, it affects your players as well. And it makes them make choices that are much more vivid in their memory. Now, vivid choices can stand out in a number of different ways. They can stand out physically, like in this image, your eyes are drawn to the bright doorways, and you're very likely to miss the actual exits, the doors that are on the right-hand side. Vivid choices can also stand out emotionally. In Bioshock, did you harvest the little sisters, or did you save them? According to the statistics, the vast majority of players actually save the little sisters, at least on their first playthrough, because saving children has a vivid emotional pull. But vivid choices can also stand out simply because they are present. I know a ton of people who actually thought that the settlement quests in Fallout were the main storyline and the main point of the game because they're always there in your quest log. They're always there, they're always present right at the very top, so they feel like they're more important. When we fall victim to the effects of the availability heuristic, we're actually succumbing to fake choices. And the effects of this will start to creep into all of your levels and take away feelings of autonomy and choice from your, from your players. The other uh, factor that dramatically influences player choice is the concept of sunk costs. This is the Fallout dude. He's giving you that one last chance to finally finalize and change your appearance. But usually, once you've made a decision like this, you are going to stick with it. It doesn't matter that the, po the path that you chose is too difficult. It doesn't matter that you can easily turn around, go back, and make another choice. There is a cost that is associated with making a decision. And once we make that choice, our brains are immediately invested in the outcome. This is a big part of what drives free-to-play games. Once you've put time and money into setting up a base for yourself, you're going to keep rebuilding that base. Even if making a new base is clearly the better option, you're more likely to keep rebuilding your old one because you've already sunk your efforts into that original decision. Now, as usual, this is due in large part to our biology. What you want is actually a different part of your brain than, it comes from a different part of your brain than what you like. You can control what you want. Like right now you could say, I wanna go sit outside in the sun. But you can't control what you like. You can't suddenly decide to like the taste of broccoli if you don't already do that. And because what you like is unconscious, that means it'll always take priority over what you want. So once our players start down a path, a bad path, whether they want to or not, they are going to continue because they're already invested in that initial decision. And your brain actually robs you of that choice to turn back. 
So there's three quick principles uh, that explain how we choose, and now I want to show you some examples of how that can influence three different types of level design, linear, open world, and of course multiplayer, my bread and butter. Linear games generally considered to be the absolute bane of level design uh, because we are putting the player on rails. And this is probably the best known image that explains how most people feel these days about linear levels. But uh, E1M6, the Doom map on the left here, was actually a completely linear level, just like the other one, but it was disguised. You were given uh, uh, colored keys that you had to collect and then you had to backtrack and we refilled those spaces with different types of encounters. Occasionally we gave you a different type of shortcut. The real difference between these two levels is that the Doom map maintains player autonomy. Now, when people talk about choices, they very often confuse the concepts of agency and autonomy. Agency is our capacity to choose, to do whatever we want, whenever we want. Autonomy, on the other hand, is our capacity to make an informed decision. It's less about choice and more just your brain agreeing to go with the flow because you've decided that that's the best option. Autonomy means that you endorse the path that you're on, even if that path is completely linear. And nothing highlights this better than speedruns. These players are on an extremely linear and unforgiving path, but they still feel like they're the ones who are in control at all times. Now, remember that no matter how open or how linear a level actually is, the player is always on a path from A to B. That's basic game theory. I give you a starting point and a goal, and you move along the path to that goal. And it's totally fine if there's only one path to get to that goal, as long as the player has the autonomy to feel like it's the path that they chose. Now, that's not new, but there are a couple of problems that, with the way that we typically try and do that sort of thing. Because of the availability heuristic, our players are already going to have a built-in set of expectations about what's coming. So to get around that, we throw things at them. We, we try and distract them with, oh, look, here's a, something bright. You should look over here, bright or colorful. Or, hey, here's an interesting encounter to distract you for a while. I'll give you a side quest to do over here. But every time you do that, you're more and more likely to actually push them past that line of paradox where they end up feeling lost or overwhelmed. And at that point, there's this special part of your brain that kicks in that is 100% devoted to filtering out all distractions. The only thing that it wants to do is get from A to B. So you put all this together, you have your brain pushing you forward, overwhelmed by distractions that it is desperately trying to ignore, but refusing to stop because the sunk cost principle means that you're already invested in reaching that destination. Basically, this is no longer a fun experience. So rather than overwhelm the player with all these distractions, I'm proposing that we could try and use something called the peak end rule to focus them. When you look back on something that's happened to you, your brain looks at how you felt at the very peak of that experience and at the very end. And over time, those two points, and only those two points, become the brain's reference for our overall emotional experience. Stress, boredom, frustration, annoyance, all of those have no effect on your long-term memory if they're far enough removed from the peak and the end points. So if you can focus on making just those two points the most vivid for your player, again, remember back to the availability heuristic, they become the most available to their memory, and then you can focus your design in a way that maximizes the enjoyability of that level, even if it's completely linear. This is one of the reasons that people can suffer for hours uh, through extremely difficult levels in Bloodborne, and still come away feeling like they had a great experience. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum, 
we have open world designs, which probably seem like they offer more choice to the player than any other type of level. But even with an open sandbox, the player's choices still have to happen within the constraints of the game's rules and systems. And I look back personally on completing the Thieves Guild quests in Skyrim and certainly Oblivion as some of my all-time favorite moments in gaming. Another shout out. But I guarantee that if you did the Thieves Guild 2, then you and I followed the exact same quests and we had the exact same outcome. You made the decision to start that quest chain, but you had no choice in the order or the outcome of the specific quests involved in that chain. You did have good autonomy along the way, and that gave you the illusion of choice. Your Thieves Guild experience probably felt a lot more unique and special than it actually was. People also feel the same way about MMOs. They go in feeling like they have almost completely unlimited choices and unlimited options. But in the end, it too is all an illusion. There is a huge sunk cost that goes into setting up a character and bringing that character all the way to max level. There's really only one right path to get them all the way there and get all the necessary gear that you want. So guilds go in and they practice their raids over and over until there's really no choice left and it's just a performance where everyone has to be in the exact right place at the exact right time and do the exact right thing in hopes of getting the exact right gear. Now, I'm not saying that there's no choice in these levels. Obviously there is, but open world doesn't necessarily mean more choice for the player, and it doesn't necessarily mean better choice for the player. When we give someone the option to go left, right, left, right, over and over and over and over, that's not choice as much as it is just simple decision making. That's the kind of thing, exactly the kind of thing that leads to players feeling overwhelmed. Real choices, and I say that in big air quotes, are meaningful, where the player has autonomy and feels responsible for the outcome, whether that outcome is good or bad. Which brings me to multiplayer, where players arguably have higher levels of autonomy than in any other type of design, because in multiplayer, choices really matter. They have this butterfly effect that impacts everyone else's choices in the server as well, in this constant loop of cause and effect. Multiplayer experiences are social, and more people means more information, and information is the currency of choice. With more information, you can make better choices, and that's what makes those decisions actually feel more meaningful. But of course, the multiplayer designer still has influence over player choice, and the goal is to make sure that the impact of that influence doesn't take away from player autonomy. Even very simple changes in architecture can affect how players make choices in a map. Here's a shot that has two different versions of the same map, and the left Im image, players almost always chose to take the left-hand path. The visuals, visuals unintentionally were funneling them in that direction. By removing that door frame, as we did in the right-hand image, we opened up lines of sight and got a much better distribution of players across the entire map, because players were able to make that choice without our influence and without us actually adding in more pathing options. Because pathing decisions in multiplayer maps shouldn't be complicated. If you look at the most popular map in virtually any multiplayer game, you'll start to notice a pattern. They leave very little path choice to the players. This is dust and Counter-Strike. You spawn in, you can choose A or B. It's one of two options. If you look at virtually any intersection in the entire map, you have two, maybe three choices in direction to go. Even uh, MOBAs, this is Summoner's Rift, League of Legends, you have 
two, or in this case, three uh, real lanes to go down. And those paths are very, very distinct and very, very obvious. Uh, last one, Gears of War, Gridlock was our most popular map. It had exactly one path. Players ran down it till they ran into each other and started shooting each other in the face. These complex, choice-filled games are actually most successful when they respect the paradox and actually remove choice. By reducing the overall cognitive load on the player, it allows them to focus on what they perceive as the most important choices, increasing autonomy and overall happiness. So how can you use this information to give, put a meaningful choice and autonomy in your own maps? Following my magic formula, I have exactly three tips for you. Um, starting with design without intent. Now, I'm not just spouting that as some like, weird philosophy. That's actually, there is actually a technical term that is used by architects and engineers called design with intent. That means employing a strategic design to purposefully influence someone's behavior. When you go to Disneyland, uh, the pathways in the architecture are purposefully designed to reduce traffic jams and help guide you with landmarks through the park, which is pretty cool. When you go to Vegas, the casinos are designed to purposefully disorient you and make you lose track of time, which isn't quite so cool. We guide our players with color and light and architecture and usually we're really good about doing that around key landmarks. But everything that we build has an impact. And we're very inconsistent about when we actually pay attention to that. We have more influence than we intend to simply because we're sloppy. In the example here, one choice has been highlighted by default, and that means that players are significantly more likely to select it even if they only do so by accident. Now, advertisers use a lot of similar techniques. There's a list of them here. I don't have time to go into all of them. They are important, so take the time to look them up if you care about this stuff. But if your goal is autonomy, these techniques are all flawed. They work because they activate that subconscious decision-making part of your brain. These techniques all actually reduce player autonomy by abusing the effects of the availability heuristic and the sunk cost principle to make players do things against their rational will. So when I say that we should design without intent, I'm not saying that we should be haphazard or sloppy. I'm saying that we should give our players options instead of influences so they can make their own choices and find their own meaning in the outcome. Next, avoid chaining decisions. If you stack decisions too closely together, the player's brain will fall into the trap of the sunk cost principle. The dominoes start to fall and they can't turn back. And the effects of this are cumulative. So the effort in making every new decision in a chain becomes increasingly more difficult. And eventually, as I've already said, the brain shuts down, that illusion fades away, and players feel less autonomy. The Witcher does really interesting thing with this, where I've actually seen reviews that people say there's too much for you to do. There's too many moral dilemmas. There's too many ways for the narrative to play out. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I can see why someone might feel that way because it's always human nature to wonder about the path that you didn't take. Over and over, over and over, until you start to believe that no matter what you choose, you've chosen incorrectly or that the other path is better or that you're missing out on something. And so regardless of how you feel about the volume of choice in The Witcher, they did do one thing very, very well. They spread out the important choices so that by the time you get from one to the next, you can feel the impact of your choice and see its actual effects on your player, on the world, and on the story. This helps the player's brain differentiate those peak and endpoints of the experience so there is a better chance that they'll find meaning and autonomy in the outcome. Lastly, 
let your players make second order decisions. Now, second order decisions are rules or strategies that people use to avoid getting frustrated by their own indecision. For example, I personally have a set of rules that I always follow when I'm gaming. Uh, whenever I'm given the option, I always choose ranged attack over melee. When I walk into a new area, I always go right first. I don't have to think about it, I just go. And that's the whole point. When I reach a fork in the road, deciding which way to go has become a second order decision because it falls behind my initial rule to always go right. Now Assassin's Creed handles this very well by offering this huge web of interconnected activities. You can decide as the player to do everything in just one single neighborhood. Or you can follow a single quest line across neighborhood borders. Or you can focus on just a single type of activity. Or you can just do things randomly as, as they happen when you're walking down the street. There are hundreds and hundreds of potential activities in a game like this, but the player decides when to approach each one and how to group them so they don't have to think about them all at the same time. This maintains that illusion that the world is impossibly large, that there are unlimited amount of activities, and that there's more choice in the outcome than there actually is. If you allow them to use second order decisions, the player is applying their own individual biases, so your influence from the availability heuristic has less effect, and it allows each person to find their own golden path through the level, which means that they'll find their own memorable peak and endpoints and construct meaning from that experience. Now, all of this, of course, barely scratches the surface of how this impacts game theory and choice and a million other related topics that I don't have time to go into today. So I would strongly encourage you to look some of this stuff up and read up on it and see how you can use that knowledge to improve your level designs. Thank you for your time.